Relationships are the heartbeat of our lives, weaving a tapestry of harmony and love. Around this table, real conversations are the bridge to understanding, and vulnerability leads to true connections to one another. Here, faith finds hope, disagreement seeks resolution, and laughter recharges the soul. Unity is the thread that bonds us together in every season. Around the table, where conversations start and where community can begin. Good morning. How are you all today? How, um, that was a great introduction. I, I feel a little old, but other than that, um, don't laugh so hard. <laughs> We are going to take communion today, and so if you are online with us, thank you for coming and grab some elements so you can join us a little bit later. So this morning, I'm going to ask you to do something that for some of you is normal, and for others of you, it has been a while. I want you to engage, you ready? Your holy imagination. Okay, so just like... Just come with me. We're going to take a little imaginative journey. You can do it. Some of you are like, yes, bring it on. And some of you are like, great. I have to use my imagination this morning. All right, yes, you do. So we're going to go back to the year 62 AD. And we're in the area called Cappadocia. Now, Cappadocia, it's beautiful. There's mountains. It's green and lush. For us, think modern-day Turkey, right? And you've lived in this area all of your life and with your family, and you share the area with some Gentiles. There's some Cappadocians, there's some Galatians, and then many of you. This morning, you are a Jew. And you find yourself walking through the marketplace, and you're so excited. You can hardly keep yourself from running, but running would be inappropriate. And so you're trying to walk really, really fast because you're going to your friend Jonas's house. And as you are headed there, you're thinking about all that's going to happen as you get to the weekly gathering this week. Because this week, it has come out through the gathering that there is a letter to be read. A letter from the apostle Peter. And you're so excited to hear what Peter has to say. And as you're working your way through the marketplace and going through all the people, you realize, oh, when was the last time I saw Peter? And you realize that the last time you saw Peter was in Jerusalem. You had gone there with your family to celebrate Pentecost. It's a festival that you really enjoy and you were with your family headed to your uncle's house to celebrate and you heard this voice and it was preaching and it was saying things that you couldn't quite comprehend. This voice talked about Joel and David and, and this person named Jesus. And he talked about how Jesus had done something for you and it hit you that this was true. So you said, brothers, as you looked at those who are with him, brothers, what, what should we do? And you remember Peter saying this, he said, each of you must repent of your sins and turn from God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And, and when he said that, you were so convicted. And you thought, I have to do that. But it wasn't just the words of Peter. It was also this incredible miracle that was going on. Because as Peter was talking, you realized that everyone around you who were from all over the area and all over the countries and even far away, people were understanding Peter, like in their own words, in their own languages. It was crazy. And you realize if this is what's happening and what he's saying is true, then I have to do something. And so you follow these guys named James and John. And you went with them to the river and you were baptized. And you can still remember it. Coming up out of the water. Feeling the Holy Spirit tingle as you stepped into a whole different way of life. It's been a few years since that day in Jerusalem few days, a few years since that moment when you felt the Holy Spirit for the first time. And it brings to mind that it had been just a couple years ago that this guy named Paul had come to your gathering in Cappadocia and had said, let me help you. Let me help you organize into something that we call a church. 
And as a part of the church, you can learn how to love each other and support each other and gather together to walk forward in this thing we call the way. About Jesus. About who he is. You finally get to Jonas's house. So you take off your sandals really quick and you slide in the door and it is packed. And so you have to kind of slide along the wall until you find a spot to sit. And then you see him. Silas is here. Silas has come to read the letter from Peter to us. This is pretty amazing. I can hardly believe it. So as Silas gets up and opens the letter, he begins to read. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect. Exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. And then Silas goes on. And in the letter, there's words from Peter about being holy in all you do. And there's words from Isaiah, and there's a psalm that is in there. And then Peter says, rid yourself of all malice and deceit. And there's words for husbands and wives and a reminder to do good and love one another and be compassionate and to be humble. And you're taking it all in and you're thinking, this is good stuff. And then Silas pauses. And he looks around the room and you realize he's going to say something important. And he talks a little bit louder. And he says this. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Okay, it sounds really important, sober-minded. So you sit up a little bit straighter against the wall. And he continues, above all, love each other deeply. Because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. And he stops. You notice there's a little uncomfortable movement within the area as you feel some uneasiness because silence is pushing something. He's looking at each of you after he says, offer hospitality without grumbling. And he's just waiting and you feel the challenge, the end is near, be alert, pray, but you also feel the invitation. How can we love each other deeply? How can I offer hospitality? You can feel it pushing. And people probably shouldn't be staying. So as you look around the refugees in the room, you realize that there are people in the room that he's talking about, that there are people you don't recognize that have filled the space, people that aren't from your town. And Silas then says to those who are visiting you that day, Will you stand? Okay, now it just got really uncomfortable. As you're looking at these people who are standing, and Silas says, who has room? You think, okay, I really don't have room. Like, my sister moved in with her kids. The kids are tripled up. There's no space in my house that I can get to by myself. Well, except for that one spot out by the barn that oh, kind of kept it for myself so I could have some space and some sanity. But all these people, I mean, they don't look like they have the money to stay somewhere, so I should probably, oh, why do I feel so guilty? Like, I don't really have room for them. But, and the silence lengthens in the room as Silas just waits. And then there's a quiet, we have room. And you look over and there's Jonas raising his hand, but his wife is going, you know we have room, right? It's about time, right? And a small smile comes onto Silas's face and soon others start to raise their hand. We have room, we have room. We can take somebody. And slowly but surely, everyone around the room sits down and you're still wrestling because you know you can feel it in your heart. I should be doing something. What can I offer? I got to have something. So Silas clears his throat because every family is now sitting and he starts back in with the letter. And he says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Oh, that's what you'll do. 
You can use what you have. You can cook, and you cook really well. So maybe they won't fit in my house, but maybe I can feed them. And as your heart settles into what you can do, you sit back to listen to the rest of the letter. And as Silas finishes his letter, he says, peace to all of you who are in Christ. And he turns to pick up the bread that Jonas's wife has made. And he holds it as we prepare to do this thing that we have done every time we have come together. A time to share a simple meal that reminds us of something. We call it koinonia, communion, community. Because no longer does this unleavened bread represent freedom from Egypt, it represents freedom in Jesus. And as you take this bread and you look to the person next to you and you realize you've sat next to a refugee, you say, this is the body of Christ given for you. You're welcome here. That's First Peter, in my own way. But as I thought about these verses for this morning, I thought, how do we even get our minds around what it was like in that first century? In our 21st century, it looks so different. We don't often allow strangers into our houses. But back then, in the first century, the houses were the church. Lydia, Priscilla, and Aquila, they were the house churches in those areas and people would just come together and have worship together and they would share a meal together because they lived life together. But over and over again throughout the New Testament, this isn't a new command. In fact, in Romans 12, it says, when God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always eager to practice hospitality. And in Titus, Paul says this of church leaders, church leaders, he must be hospitable to believers as well as strangers. Okay, so that's the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, in Leviticus, in Isaiah, it says share your home, share what you have, offer safety. It's a lot of hospitality. So as I was processing hospitality, I realized we think of it so different. I mean, I think of (laughs) Chick-fil-A. Let's be real, customer service. We think of hospitality as customer service. We rate people on it. How is their hospitality? And it's, well, this hotel has great room service, and so therefore they have high hospitality. But that's not what we're talking about here. The hospitality that Christians are called to was to meet a need of their fellow believers that didn't have any place to go because it wouldn't have been safe for them. The Christians of the first century were persecuted. and They were poor. They needed places to stay as they traveled. They needed places where they could be safe from those who were coming against them. And so the church was the answer. The church stepped up and said, we will offer hospitality. Now, in Beyond the Weekend podcast this week, Mandy and I are going to talk about the history then of how from the first century to now, so what's happened? So be sure to tune in if you're interested in in the progression of hospitality in the church. But it's enough to know that Jesus called his church to meet a pressing need of their day. Now in 1 Peter 4, 9, the word for hospitality is actually phloxenos. I know, great word. Philo, the first part of that word means brotherly love, and xenos means guest. So it meant give brotherly love to the guests. Allow them to have a place to be. Now, the Amplified Bible is a version of the Bible that I enjoy now and then just because whoever made this version helped on certain words by expanding what those words actually made for us right within the text so that we can understand them. So I thought, here's 1 Peter 4.9 in the Amplified Bible to just broaden it a bit. It says this, practice hospitality to one another those of the household of faith. Be hospitable, be a lover of strangers with brotherly affection for the unknown guests, the foreigners, the poor, all the others who come your way who are of Christ's body. And in each instance, do it ungrudgingly, cordially and graciously without complaining, but as representing him. That's a tall order. And we're going to call it biblical hospitality because it's different than just having people over for dinner, which is really nice. 
But this is an act of the heart to put action toward others, caring for people who believe and even people who don't, caring for all who come across our path. Biblical hospitality is both love and action given to meet the need of someone else. Okay, take that in. Biblical hospitality is both love and action given to meet a need of someone else. So as we take 1 Peter into our current world, I thought, okay, if the church at that point was called to meet a need, then what is the church today called to meet? What can we be doing in our current world to meet a need that maybe, in my opinion, only the church can answer? Where do we need to show love in action? So let me take you back a little bit. So back in August, we hosted the Global Leadership Summit, which is an incredible leadership element that we offer online at the other campus. And um, one of the speakers, and I can't remember which one, but I wrote down the the statistics. It says this, 52% of Americans report feeling lonely. 47% report that their relationships aren't meaningful. 61% of younger people in the United States say they are chronically lonely. 51% of mothers of young children report feeling lonely. Those are big numbers. And I know there's a lot of factors behind these statistics, right? There's some fear, there's some hurt, there's some other elements, but the problem all boils down to the same thing, loneliness. So I dove in a little bit, and I found that the Surgeon General, our current Surgeon General, which, I mean, how many of us actually know his name, right? This is what he said. He said, our epidemic of loneliness and isolation has been an underappreciated public health crisis that has harmed individual and societal health. Whoa. And to be clear, he goes on to say, and you can feel lonely even if you have a lot of people around you. Because loneliness is about the quality of your connections. Now, some of you in this room, you have quality connections, and so loneliness isn't an element that you deal with, but I would bet that there are those of you here who do. Loneliness, social isolation, a lack of feeling like we belong can affect us physically, mentally, spiritually. And it's an epidemic, which is a scary word. And you know, it's not just for people who don't know Jesus. Anybody can feel lonely. We've created community and connection, right? We are created for it. We want it for you. We just shared our names. We just shook hands. We want you to feel like you're a part of a community. The church was called to do that. And I think in our current age, the church needs to step up and answer this epidemic. Because we know what it takes to not feel lonely. We are built for it. It's called biblical hospitality. So when we come around a table, we extend an invitation. We want to be a welcoming community. We want people to know that they have an opportunity. Because if you think about it, what is our world wanting to take away from so many? Through technology, through all the other elements, even working from home sometimes can make us feel isolated. And so we crave connection and value. We want to be seen. But yet so often our work and our world perpetuates something different. We just want to know we're worthy. And to recognize that we're actually here. We want relationships that mean something. Not just, hey, how you doing? But someone who sees us. And when we look at the early church, hospitality had nothing to do with whether you were an extrovert. I know, who knew? Or someone who just loved to get to know a lot of people. Community, hospitality meant doing life together at a level of every day. It was interwoven into all that they did, all of their personal lives and their work lives and everything were interconnected so that they did life together. It's pretty amazing. But today, if we're honest, We have a public persona and a private persona. The one we let people see and the one only our family sees. 
if we allow them to. To go back to the Surgeon General, he says this, our relationships are a source of healing and well-being hiding in plain sight. It's one that can help us live healthier, more fulfilled, and more productive lives. I mean, it's like he's quoting 1 Peter. This is a biblical truth that when we do life together, the answer being relationships, right? It matters. And I think as a church, we can offer this. We can get this done well if we're willing. My older brother was texting me a couple weeks ago. He lives up in a small town with his wife. And uh, it was, I don't even remember, a Friday night, and he's texting me. He's bored. So, of course, he wants to talk. <sighs> Your big brother, what are you going to do? And he basically said, I'm just really lonely. So being his little sister who works in the church, I said, have you tried the church? He said this, I've tried three churches. And the people don't want to meet anybody new. It's a small town, so he gets that it's kind of clicky. But this is what he also said. He said, the churches around here are so focused on kids that adults aren't necessarily welcome. Oh. Guess which area of the church I oversee? Adult ministry. I don't want anyone to come to Cornerstone and feel like there isn't a place for them to connect. But as I think about my brother, I realize that maybe you're here this morning and you feel like him. Kind of lonely, wishing you had someone to just do life with. Thank you for coming. Thank you for stepping in our building. Thanks for being here. It is so hard to take that courageous step to go somewhere where you might not know anyone and you might not feel seen by anyone and yet you're willing to come. And I hope this morning you can discover that we are a safe place to connect. We took a survey a few weeks ago trying to learn more about who you are. In it, in it, we asked this question. How many of you are de-churched? Meaning you used to go to church, but then the church hurt you or the church didn't seem friendly anymore and so therefore you stepped away and you're just trying to come back. That was 11%. So with our attendance, that's 200 people that said, I was hurt by the church, but I am willing to take a little step back in just to try the water, to see if this church will be different. And I think that's amazing. And I pray that we are a church that can be welcoming beyond a name. But to do that, guys, I think we have a little way to go. I don't think we're there yet. I think we've taken some cool steps. So I want to just share with you that I think that if we are going to be a church that truly offers biblical hospitality, that we have to figure out how to be truly authentic. And by that, I mean vulnerable with each other. And that can be so hard. It sounds simple. Just share yourself. Ah. But a lot of us have that personal and private life, and we don't like to share our private life. That feels too vulnerable, and so we separate them. And then we aren't authentic. I think that there's a lot of reasons behind that. I think there's some fear and shame that we are afraid other people might know. There's probably some hurts from someone that we actually were friends with before. I mean, vulnerability, accountability, authenticity, they're uncomfortable. But yet, those of us who know we belong should step from that comfort and confidence to help others. And when we do, it's amazing the community that forms. But if we never seek community, then we face the opposite, isolation and loneliness. So this is where 1 Peter 4.10 comes in when he says, each of you should give whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards in God's grace in its various forms. I mean, be you. Use what you have. However that looks for you to offer biblical hospitality, that's what he's saying we should do. And if we do that, then we have to do something else. We have to cultivate a culture of connection. And that takes time. Culture takes time. And so if we're going to do that, we have to figure out how to live at a level that's integrated. It's why 
It's why we love life groups so much because we wanna encourage you to figure out how to live life with other people so that you have a group that will care for you and see you, not just when you're at church, but every single day. Now from the book of Acts, the early Christians were known for their hospitality. In Acts 2.42, it says, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. And in sharing in meals, according, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. They shared meals. They took care of widows. They helped the poor. They saw the welfare of those in their community as their responsibility at a take care of you level. And it set them apart. In fact, it set them apart to the extent that others wanted to join their community just because of how loving and kind and gracious they were and how generous they were. It was a whole communal mindset that we kind of struggle with today. I mean, think about it. The message of the gospel is that Jesus came for everyone because he loves everyone. And that alone unifies us. But when we look at the communion table, that meal brings unity because we are all level at the foot of the cross, right? We all can come together. So this morning, I'm going to ask you to do something kind of hard. Well, actually, it's not hard, but for some of you, it might be. I thought, you know, sharing a meal is an intimate way to get connected to other people. And even though we're not going to have a conversation, I would like us to share a meal this morning, some koinonia, communion. And to do this, we're going to um, serve each other. Okay, I don't know if we've ever done this at Cornerstone. I know you haven't done it here. But in a few minutes, the servers are going to come, and they're going to start at the end of a row, and you're going to take it and receive as someone says, this is the body of Christ given for you. And then you're going to turn and offer that to the person next to you, saying those words. This is the body and blood of Christ given for you. And as you pass it, then they will take it and pass it to the next. And you'll take your communion cup and pass it to the next. And for those of you at the end of the row, you're just going to turn around and give it to the person behind you and send it back. So for this area, we're going to start on this end. And you're just going to weave it all the way to the back. And for you guys in the middle, you're going to start and you're just going to weave it. Yes, you're going to have to... You're going to have to actually get up and cross an aisle. I know. And for those of you over here, the same. It's just going to weave to the back. And so if you have to get up and go over a few seats. Now, if you're not comfortable taking communion, totally get it. It's okay. Just go ahead and let the bucket go past you. Let someone else serve the people. Communion unifies us. And so this morning, as you actually literally share a meal that represents what Jesus has done, say those words to the person next to you. And then whenever you're ready, once you have the elements, whenever you're ready, go ahead and open them and take the bread, well, a little wafer, and take the cup and go ahead. You're going to watch something that will help lead you through. And if you are gluten-free, all you need to do is raise your hand and we will bring it to you. Alrighty, so let me pray, and we're going to dive in. Heavenly Father, as we share a meal this morning, as we serve each other through a culture of connection, help us to truly see the person next to us. In your name, amen.
as I continue, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take those elements as a part of a meal that celebrates what Jesus has done for us. I'm gonna close with just one last thing. In order to truly practice biblical hospitality, we have to be safe. We need this place to be safe. In another study, a question was asked, or a statement was made, and it's this. Churches should be a safe place for hurting people. And honestly, lonely people are often hurting. And of those who were surveyed, those who were churched people, 59% of churched people think that's true, and that should be true. But what's interesting is 45% of people who don't attend church want that to be true. So can that be true of us? Can we be a safe place? On the discipleship team, we ask that question all the time. What if the church is the safest place for anyone to be? What if coming in here on a Sunday morning, any night during the week when other things are going on, anytime people came, this was the safest place to think? Safest place physically. A safe place to be fed safe from lies in the culture that's around us to set us apart? What if it's a place that says, ask your questions? It's okay. You're loved, and we see you. What if it's a place that offered counseling for those who definitely needed help? What if it's a place that offers food and support and actually changes the narrative of someone who has been hurt by the church to someone who can see what the church really can be? What if it's a place where every child is loved and every teenager is seen? It's possible, but it's up to us to practice it. And it's hard and it's uncomfortable. It's sharing across the aisle. It's offering a meal to someone you may not even know, but you're sitting right next to this morning. Back in September, I attended a retreat, and at it, I was working on this message. And so I thought, okay, ladies, most of them are from the church. What would you say is hospitality in the church? And one lady said this. She says, it's an attitude of generosity. Think about that. Open-handed, willing to share, a communal mindset, generously offering, because I gotta tell you, when someone is out here and we bring them in here, it doesn't lessen the table in any way. It actually multiplies the table when we add to it. And I think sometimes we're afraid. But if I welcome them in, then my group has to expand. Yes, it does. And isn't that amazing? That's the multiplication. So church, what if we were willing to do that? To own this command, to love each other deeply in such a way that it covers a multitude of sins, and then to offer hospitality without grumbling so that we can truly be a place of authenticity and connection and safety for those in our world who need it. Now, as I close, I want to say that the first church doesn't have to be the only ones who live that way. And so this morning, realizing that some of you this morning came with loneliness, you came with a feeling of isolation, and you feel no one has seen you in a while. I've asked some prayer servants to come and just be available because this morning I want you to feel seen. And so I encourage you, I know it's hard, but I encourage you, if you are in need of prayer this morning, we want to be a community of koinonia and communion, so I encourage you to come and pray with them. Be seen. Let them bring you to Jesus with them because we want to be a place that truly does this one another thing. Loving one another, we've been talking about it for a few weeks now. How you doing? Are you loving well? As Alex spoke last week, are you allowing judgment to leave your brain? Are you allowing yourself to see others as Jesus sees them? So this morning, please come if you need prayer. As we close with this song, I encourage you to process if that's you. So as the band comes... As the prayer servants come, I will close us in prayer. Heavenly Father, may we be a church that sees individual people, 
that's willing to step into a life and allow it to become a part of ours, that's willing to be uncomfortable in order to be vulnerable and authentic, that's willing to create a culture of connection over time to truly dive into someone else's life and allow them into our own. And Lord, may we do it through your love, which unifies us. Lord, we thank you for the communion table. May it never lose its importance in our lives. That to share a meal that represents you is what unifies us. And Lord, may we be safe. Safe to love, safe to do your work. And may those who come feel you here. In your name, amen.